Okay, welcome back. So let's pick up from where we stopped. We looked at Exodus 28 and how God through his Holy Spirit gave special ability to certain people to, you know, for the building of the tabernacle, furniture, for garments, the priests, so for the garments the priests should wear. So what do we learn from this? We learn that God is interested in the intricate details that he works with. He's interested in our details, right? So think of this as believers. He's interested. The Holy Spirit is interested in you, in me. He's interested in the smallest details of our lives. Right? It could be something very insignificant, but he's interested in it. Right? It could be, you know, you're praying to God for something very small. And sometimes we feel, oh, God. You're very busy. You're, I know you have a lot of other things to do. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit is interested in the intricate, smallest details of your life. Right? Right. Okay, let's get into Numbers chapter 11, 17. You know, we'll not read the whole passage. Numbers 11, we'll read a few portions so that we get a context. And then I'll just explain a few things from there. Numbers chapter 11. Verse 17 onwards. Okay, before you read that, now the people of Israel have come out from Egypt. They've been grumbling, they've been murmuring. Right? Can you think of this? They are in bondage for 400 years. God does these great miracles in front of their own eyes. God parts the seas into two. They walked on dry land. Have you read that poor part? Right? When it rains here, how is it? Two days that it will be wet. The people of Israel walked on dry land. They saw the pillar of fire. They saw the clouds that followed. They saw these great miracles of God. They've come out of Egypt. You know what they're doing? They wanted to kill Moses. They said, Moses, you brought us into this desert and now we don't have food. We don't have water. You brought us out to kill us. At least in Egypt, we had cucumbers. That's what the Bible says. We ate cucumber in Egypt. They worried about cucumbers. And God is saying, hey, I'm making you a nation, a great nation. You've seen the miracles, but still you're like grumbling. Uh, Numbers chapter 7, God sends quail from, from heaven so that people can gather up and eat. So let's read from verse 16 onwards. Is that where it is? Yes, 16, 17, 17 onwards. Go ahead. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I, I will take the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. Mm. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. Okay, verse 16 will bring context. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Make them come to the tent of the meeting and then uh, that they may stand there with you. Then verse eight, uh, 17, I will come down and speak with you. Now, here's what's happening. Moses has brought this whole, you know, three million people out of Israel. Now, you know, out of Egypt. Now, think of this. They're all fighting among themselves. And Moses is going and solving the problems. No, actually, you don't fight. You know, be good to each other. Don't fight. You should share. Now, tell me something. Right? Moses is thinking, first, I have to go speak to God. I have to go on that mountain. I keep speaking to him. I speak to God face to face. God himself is saying, with all you other people, I speak in riddles and dreams and all of it. But with Moses, I speak face to face. And now he's solving problems. You took more quail. You took my bed last night. You took, you know, silly problems. And now God is saying, okay, bring 70 elders. Come to the tent of the meeting, and when they are there, I will take some of the spirit from you and put it 
on the 70 people, the 70 elders there. What does he mean by that? It only means God is going to take some of the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that God has placed upon Moses as a leader, and I'm going to distribute it with the 70 people. The leading, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy, the gift of leading. Now look at the life of Moses. What a what a life, right? He was trained in the palace, very well learned. Now don't go by what that movie Ten Commandments shows, right? If you have that in mind, please remove it. That's not how it is. When he was forty, he knew. He knew the book of uh, Acts. Stephen is saying he knew that he was the one who God has chosen to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. He knew it. But he tried to do it his own way. He killed the Egyptian. He had to run off. 40 years he waited. You know, very interesting. That's the best part about the word. In the book of Exodus, when he's in front of the bush, burning bush, what does he say? Moses says, I don't know how to speak. My tongue, tongue is tied. I don't know how to speak. The book of Numbers, he says, Moses was well learned and very eloquent in speech. Who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses. He only wrote it. What happened? This 40 years, right? 40 years of looking after his father in law's sheep from where to where? From the palace to becoming a shepherd. 40 years humbled him. Now he's saying, I don't know how to speak. But God says, Listen, I'll speak for you. He says, still, he says, no, don't send me. He says, okay, at least your brother will speak for you. But I'm sending you because I've chosen you, Moses. And so here the people of Israel were grumbling. These 70 leaders are there. God took the anointing, the grace of Moses, and distributed it among the 70. Now they were lead, led by the Holy Spirit. If there were decisions to be made, they were led by the Holy Spirit, right? If there were you know, challenges and problems that are there, they were led by the Holy Spirit, right? Everyone with me? Okay. So, the, so let's go to Numbers 24. Now, Numbers 24, again, is very interesting. Balaam. How many of you have read the stories of Balaam? It's a, it's a little... Uh, some of us may say, I never went to the book of Numbers at all. I don't look at that book. Too many numbers. But this is a very interesting story. If you can, just take some time and read it. Now, Balaam, there was another person named Balak who was a Moabite. Uh, and, and he says to Balaam, Balaam, you prophesy and curse Israel. Balaam says, no, I can't curse Israel. I can't curse. Then he, but Balaam goes back to God and says, God, you know, Balak is saying you curse Israel. God says, don't even think about it. How can you curse what I have blessed? So he goes, it's a long story, but uh, I'm not going to narrate the whole story. And he goes and says to Bala, no, I'm not going to do it. Right? And this happens about three times. Bala prophesied the work, prophesied by the Spirit of God. Right? He said, how can I curse what God has blessed? And he's pronounced a blessing over Israel. And Balak was saying, see, I called you to curse them. You've made it worse by blessing them even more. Right. And so we see that all through, again, we can see many, many places. Elijah was led by the Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, Elisha was led by the Holy Spirit. Remember Elisha? That's a very interesting again. Gehazi is there. Again, he's led by the Holy Spirit. He says, didn't my spirit go with you? I know what you did. I know what wrong you did. Balaam prophesied by the Spirit of God. Elisha, Elijah prophesied by the Spirit of God. David prophesied by the Spirit of God. Remember the book of Psalms? He prophesies. He says so many things about uh, the Messiah, the Messianic Psalms, right? Talking about the cross, which is going to happen many, many years later. Right? Isaiah prophesied. You know, so much through the Spirit of God. Right? 
Isaiah is, is a brilliant Old Testament book. You have to read it because it's got so much of detail, prophetic detail to Christ's coming, to Christ's second return, to everything. It's a small Bible on its own. Right? So all this happened through the Spirit of God. It is God who ministered to them. God gave them the word and they put it into action. They said it and they wrote it down. Look at Jeremiah. Right? Again, God said, you do this. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it's, you know, so many things are happening there. God tells Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. Right? So all of this is led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke and they were able to do what God told them to do. Josh, sorry, Numbers chapter 27 and verse 18. Talking about Joshua now. Numbers 27, verse 18. Let's read that, please. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Go ahead, keep reading. And set him before Eliezer, the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a ch charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be yeah. obedient. Yeah. So again, now God has brought the people out of Israel. He's chosen Moses. Now the work must continue. Because Moses disobeyed, he could not get into the promised land. And so he's by the rivers of Kadesh. And he can see the promised land. God tells Moses, okay, Moses, choose Joshua. Because in him is the spirit. Now when we talk about the word spirit here, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the, the spirit of man. The desire of man to go after God, right? Take this man, Joshua, and you commission him to lead the people into the promised land, right? And when they do that, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see that God had led Joshua so beautifully. Remember the, the walls of Jericho? What happened there? God says, Joshua, here's what you do. Don't go by your strength. Don't go by the army. Don't go by all of that. What you do is you just go, you select all your people, march around that wall seven times. Every day for seven days, seven times. Now, why would you do that? It was the leading of the Holy Spirit. Have you read, if you read the book of Joshua, not even a stone moved. It was not like after the first day, the stone was cracking. Nothing. Nothing moved. Everything was the same. The seventh day till the sixth time, everything was the same. But on the seventh time, the walls came crumbling down. This is nothing but the Holy Spirit leading Joshua to do it this way. Amen? So... We see that in every way, in every place, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is working. He's there in the picture. He, he may not be very prominent at all times, but he's there. He's just leading. He's just guiding. Right? Remember David? David says, you know, uh, he, uh, he, he's anointed of God and he, he knew to what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit. All of his psalms was all about the leading of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit ministered to him in his difficult times. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Why is he saying that? He's already hiding and running away from, from, his, uh, you know, from his son. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I bless the Lord. Even though I don't see it, I don't feel it, the Holy Spirit is saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. So, all through the Old Testament, you see Jonah, you see Daniel, all the prophets, right? The work of the Holy Spirit. Then you also see it in the judges. When Israel was in danger, Israel was surrounded by nations, Babylon, Assyria, all these nations are coming against Israel. 
They wanted to destroy Israel. The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord came upon various leaders to enable them so that they'll be able to fight off the works of the enemy. Right? And one, one story is Gideon. Gideon's story is brilliant. Now you have an army coming against Israel. God says to Gideon, Gideon, you don't need so many people. I said, God, but there are you know so many people. It's a vast army. God says, You don't need so many people. What you do is you if you read the story, it's very interesting. God says, You ask the people, whoever to, you know, to drink of the water, whoever drinks like with the with, by cupping their hands, and whoever licks the water like dogs, you send them home. Only those who cup their hands and drink with their hands, you take them in the army. There were about 300 people left. 300 against thousands. God, God used them. 300 was able to defeat the thousands. So sometimes, you know, as human beings, we sometimes look at things in the natural and say, God, it looks impossible. There are thousands of people. How can 300 go? See, when the Spirit of God is leading us, we are to be obedient to it because he has a way. He has a plan. He has a purpose. We may not understand the entire picture, but he does. Right? He understands the big picture. He understands when we go through challenges. He understands when we go through difficulties. He understands the storms that we face in life. He understands. He knows it all. But here's the thing. He has the bigger picture of what is happening that's when the holy spirit comes and he uh, you know he ministers to us and he says go back to work trust in the lord trust in my work it may not make sense to you now joseph you're in prison it may not make sense to you now but you will understand why you're there daniel you're being put in the lines then now but you will understand why you are there later on moses Right now, you're looking at the sheep. It's 40 years. I know it's difficult, but I know, I know that you are, you know, just waiting, but you will understand when the time comes. David, I know that I've anointed you when I was when you were about 12 years old, and you're waiting to become the king, but now you're running away from Saul, you're hiding in caves. You don't understand now, but there will come a time you will understand. And that's the responsibility of us as believers. Even as he orchestrates things in our life, we may not understand, but we walk in obedience. Right? And so we see this uh, in the book of Judges alone Othaniel, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson. Uh, Samson was led by the Holy Spirit. Right? Now let's read uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Interestingly, we look again at what I spoke of. The life of Samuel, First Samuel chapter three and verse one. Now, everyone know who Samuel is? Yes, who's he? Sorry, he was a man that I know. Who was Samuel? Prophet. Okay, First Samuel chapter three and verse one. Read that. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There were no open vision. And it came to pass at the time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wag. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the first first verse, right? The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. Interesting scripture there. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. You know why? Think of this. God had, had you know, in, in Genesis 2, God says, my seed will crush the serpent's head. Talking about Jesus. But then God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. He's going on sending prophets. Turn away from God. Turn away from sin. Come back to God. Prophets to the northern part of Israel, to the southern part. To Judah, to Israel. To Ju He's going on sending prophets, but nobody is listening. So what does God do? He doesn't give any prophetic word. No visions, no dreams, nothing. 
And so during the time of Samuel, there was very, very little of visions and dreams and prophetic word. And God chooses Samuel at a very young age. Right. And we know the story, right? He was sleeping and he hears a voice and then it happens about two times. Third time he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So we see that the Holy Spirit chose Samuel. There was a there was a choosing there was same same chapter was 19 through 21. Let's read. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Deir Sheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Siloah, for the Lord revealed himself to the Samuel in Siloah by the word of the Lord. Right. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew. Look at that uh, next portion there. And and all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet. Samuel was attested as a prophet, meaning the Holy Spirit is with Samuel. And he was attested as a prophet. So Samuel prophesied, right? If you can, you know, whenever you're free, go back and read Samuel chapter 5, 1 Samuel 15. Uh, go back and read it. And even you can also read Samuel chapter 13, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. Just read these. You see how brilliantly prophetic and to the detail Samuel was. It cannot be done by the flesh. It was the Holy Spirit just revealing to him. Uh, then we look at Saul. Saul, the uh, in the Old Testament, Saul who became the king, the first king of Israel, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 and 10. Go ahead, read it, please. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with him, and shall be turned into another man. Right. So again, this is the choosing of Saul, the prophet, Saul the, as a king. The same, the, he, you know, Samuel prophesied, and when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, Saul also prophesied. The same spirit comes upon him when he gains victory in the battle. First Samuel chapter 11 and verse 6. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul when he heard those tidings and his anger was killed greatly. Hmm. The and spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. Again, we see that attribute of the Holy Spirit coming upon and going. Right, the spirit of the Lord left when he was disobedient. First Samuel chapter sixteen, sixteen verse thirteen through sixteen. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him, upon David from the day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Hmm. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servant with a with our before thee to seek out a man who is a, a cunning prayer and a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee. Okay, okay, uh, stop there. Uh, go to verse 23. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Okay, you see two things happening here. One is the spirit of the Lord comes upon David as he's anointed king. Two is we see the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul because he disobeyed God. Right? He departed. And it talks about an uh, evil spirit that came and tormented him. Verse 23 says, whenever David played on the harp, right, the, the evil spirit would leave Saul and he would be at relief. What a beautiful example of, of worship that is anointed. Here's David. He's playing the harp, but he's playing in, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We don't see an account of... 
saw David praying, rebuking the spirit, nothing. All he's doing is he's playing the harp and the evil spirit would leave Saul. When you and I do things, do ministry, do whatever we do under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we will see the work of God happening there. We will see the enemy will not prevail. Yes, Saul was afflicted. He was troubled by this evil spirit. Just a few, just maybe a song from David under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That evil spirit had gone. The spirit of the Lord. And when you look at David, the spirit of the Lord came on him from that day forward. 1 Samuel 16 and 13 says that. So when Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now, think of this. One of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is strength, right? power. And you got this young boy looking after sheep. And David says, I've killed the bear and the lion with my own hands. How many of you have seen a lion up close? You have? I remember, you know, we were in another, another country once uh, overseas. And we went into this, this, uh, you know, this lion park. It was only lions there. And one of the warnings that they give us is because we, you can go into the park uh, in your cars, in your personal cars, but they've written there, we're not responsible for anything. Right? They've written there. We're not responsible. If you want, you can take the, you know, those safaris which are all covered and, you know, metal and strong. You can go in one of those. But if you're taking your personal car, we are not uh, responsible. But I was really interested, so I wanted to go in a personal, you know, in the car because I wanted to because you can really go and you can see the lions there. You can go till the lion. They said you have to, because lions know how to unlock the car, so you have to have your car glass up at all times and the car locked at all times. Now, since I wasn't with my children, I said, I'll go. So I went and we went in, in, into the car, in the car and we went into deep into the forest, right? It's probably a you know, 600, 700 acres place. And the lions, you could hear the roar of the lions. Right? It, it just echoes, the whole place echoes. Right? And I remember I was sitting in the car, and this lion was right there looking straight at me. I shook to my bones, I'll tell you. It is not, you know, Daniel in the lion's den, you've seen that Bible, three Bibles are smiling, three lions are smiling at you. That's not how it is. These lions were ready to attack, ready to pounce. Right? And I really understood two things. One was I remembered Daniel in the lion's den. And two, I thought of David. You cannot go against a lion who is hungry. And Dan David says, I killed the lion with my bare hands. It is not possible. It's impossible by human efforts. Impossible. You got a small boy saying, I, I, I killed the lion with my own hands. It is by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When the strength of the Lord comes upon you, you can do things that normally you cannot do. That is one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. And David was so strong and he said, I have killed the lion and the bear with my own hands. This Goliath is nothing compared to the lion. Now you see the picture? Goliath is standing there, I'm the tallest. Hey, I've killed the lion and the bear. The lion and the bear is stronger than you. How long will it take for me? So it didn't matter to David. Why is that? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The strength of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we look at things that we have to do. Say, oh man, this is impossible. This is so difficult. No, you tap into the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, give me the strength. Give me the wisdom to do the things in the right way. Help me to be wise what step to take. The Holy Spirit is there. Right? And he'll give us the strength. Then the Psalms that he wrote, many, many Psalms. 
that David wrote was under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Then we look at Nathan, who was a prophet during the reign of uh, David and Solomon. He revealed God's plan to David in the building of the temple. And also Nathan was whom God used to rebuke David. Remember Bathsheba? When David sinned against Bathsheba, God sent the prophet Nathan. He said, Nathan, I have a very difficult task for you. You have to go to the king of Israel. His name is David. Now, he's a good man. He's a man after my own heart. But I have some bad news for you. Nathan, you have to go and tell him that he has sinned against God. Listen. Just because we are led by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean at all times we are right. David was anointed by the Holy Spirit, but he sinned against God. And God used somebody else to come and rebuke the, the king of Israel. Nathan comes, he explains the whole story and he says, what do we do with this kind of a man? David says, he ought to be killed. That man is you. So, very important lesson. Sometimes we may be, God may use us in a great way, great anointing. He may, you know, open many doors for us. Be careful. Be careful where you put your step, right? God can use somebody else and bring correction in our life. Never look at somebody and say, who are you to tell me this? What did David do? David said, yes. I have sinned against God. I have sinned against God. And he changes his life. He says, he goes back. He puts on sackcloth ashes. He changes. He writes Psalm 51. He says, create in me a clean heart of God. Renew a right spirit within me. I've done, I've done a sin. I've sinned against you. So he gets his life back. Have you ever wondered why God calls David the man after my own heart? He did so many things wrong, but sorry. Yeah, very true. He understands. Right? Uh, David did so many mistakes. He says, He's a man after my own heart. His heart was right before God. That's what God looks at. Right? Then we see the Holy Spirit in first and second kings. Let's open and look at the life of Elijah. Everyone with me? Okay, the book of First Kings in the life of Elijah. First Kings chapter 18 and verse 12. And it shall come, pass, come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee, whether I know not. And so when I come and tell her that he can't find thee, she shall slay me, but I thy servant fear the Lord, from my youth. Yeah. So in this chapter, in chapter 17, Elijah has been fed by the ravens. And in chapter 18, Elijah and Obadiah, who's another prophet, I'll just bring context here. Elijah was a prophet during the reign of Ahab. He heard God and anointed Hazel, king over Israel. But Jehu, the king over Israel, and Elisha, and Elisha as his successor. Now, listen, what happens is, uh, I'll, I'll just try to you know, just summarize the entire story here. Obadiah says, he goes to Elijah and says, Elijah, the king wants you. If, if I don't take you back, I'm going to be in trouble. So please come back. Come, because the king wants to talk to you. Right Now, Elijah is saying, hey, I don't know where the spirit of the Lord will take me. You can't tell me to come because the spirit of the Lord from here can take me to another place at an, uh, and do something else. So I have to be obedient to the spirit of God. And we look at the life of Elijah. He was led by the spirit of God. Remember, he prayed and he said, go and tell King Ahab for the next three years, it's not going to rain. And it was so just as he had said. Right? Right? After three years, he goes and he, he prays and he says, God, send your rain on the nation of Israel. God says, okay, I'll do that. So what is, sorry, God himself says to Elijah, go and tell Ahab it's going to rain. 
So what does Elijah do? He goes back and he prays. He puts his head into, his, into the ground and he begins to pray. Very, very important lesson as believers for us. The Lord may speak to us. He may give us a thought or his direction in our life. But just because he said it doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately. Or just because he said it doesn't mean we don't have a part to do. Look at this. God told Elijah it's going to rain. What did Elijah do? Did he go back home and rest and say, okay, it's going to rain? God said it, it will be done. He didn't do that. He went back and he prayed. He said, Gehazi, sorry, uh, Elisha, go and check if it's raining. He goes and checks, nothing. Goes back to pray. Go and check if it's raining. Not raining. Six times that happened. Seventh time he says, Elisha, go and check if it's raining. And when he goes there, he says, okay, Elijah, I saw the clouds. There was a small cloud in the size of a fist. Very small. Ah, that's your sign. Go and tell Ahab. Get ready for rain. What an important lesson for us. God can tell us something, but it is our responsibility to pray and ask God to fulfill it in our life. Amen? I'm just going to give you a few examples. In the year 2009, 8 or 9, I went to APC Central Church. Have you all been to the main church? APC Central. I remember going to that church and I was watching the worship team. Man, how are these guys playing? You know, during those days, there were no in years and all of that. So, but they were playing so well. Everything was so. Uh, you know, everyone was so well gifted and trained. The way they led the worship was so beautiful. And just a thought came to me, God, I want to do this one day. I said, oh, man. Now, but immediately I felt in my spirit, one day you will stand there. Now, I didn't go home and do nothing about it. If I have to stand and lead in the church, I have to learn. Right now, I was already playing a few chords on the guitar. I knew a little bit of music, but I knew that's not enough. Because if I have to, if God is saying you will do that, I have to do something about it. Yes or no? So I went back home and I wrote down, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Every day I'm going to practice. I'm going to learn the songs. I'm going to learn how to sing. Right? I'm going to learn how to sing melodies, sing harmonies, sing parts. Got to learn all of it. But I spent many hours on the guitar. Doing what? Finger exercise. Hours. I'm talking about sometimes I would sit, it would be three hours on the guitar. Sometimes say two hours, sometimes four hours, just continuously on the guitar. Why? One day I'm going to stand. So I have to be good. So many, many, many years I practiced, I would sing. And you know what I would do? I remember I, I, I bought the guitar and I would stand in front of the mirror. Okay, shall we rise up in the presence of God? Congregation, please rise. Yeah. So I would read a verse from the Bible and I would lead the worship for 50 minutes. I would make five songs. 50 minutes under the mirror alone. My parents thought I was mad. But 50 minutes, every day, exhorting everything, every single day, either morning or evening. So this happened for many years. And then I auditioned for the worship team in, I think, 20, 2010, I think, 2010 or 2011. Auditioned for the worship team. I got into the worship team. Then I started playing in the locations. You all have, going, you all have gone to North? Right, north you are going to, right? North. So there's north, south, east, west. So I used to go to these locations. And then in 2015, I saw the, you know, we get these rosters, right? So who's going where? So I, I saw my name at Central. I, I saw it again. I said, God, after, after how many years? 
After so many years, I'm getting a chance. So I remember that Sunday, I, I couldn't prepare the song. I was so nervous. But I knew that this is God. Prepared myself, went, led the worship. Some of it went okay, some of it didn't go okay. But then it really encouraged me because I said, I have to pick up my game. Because these guys playing with the band are really good. Right? They are really good. So I can't mess up. So then I began to really practice. So what am I saying? I'm trying to say. And then after that, I began to you know, continually lead worship there at Central for many, many years. The point is, if God says something, there's something that we need to do. Right? From the time I was in nursery, or I would say first standard, to 10 standard, I never went on a stage. Never. I was so fearful. Even for my 10 standard marks card, I told them, you post it home. I'm not coming on the stage. I'm very scared. I can't come on the stage. Never been on stage. Whether it is children's church, Sunday school, never been on the stage. I don't like the stage. Very afraid of the stage. But I realized that if God wants you to do something, you got to do it. you got to step out of your comfort zone. And here, God told Elijah, it's going to rain. He went back and he prayed. God may tell you, I'm going to plant, I'm going to use you to plant a church. I'm going to use you to be an apostle or a missionary. Don't go back and sleep the whole day. Go back to your knees, pray and ask God for guidance. Ask God to reveal and open doors for you. He will do it. He will really do it. But you have to, you have a part. I have a part. Amen. Right? And so we learn a very important lesson here. Again, we see uh, Elisha. Elisha was a prophet who succeeded Elijah. And what did he do? He again was very prophetic in nature. God used him uh, to, he prophesied about the famine that would affect Israel for seven years. He prophesied about uh, Jehoash's victory over Syria. So there was many, many prophecies that Elisha again made. So we see this very beautiful trend. Right? It, it's, it's a picture of the work of the Holy Spirit working in different ways. If you read the book of Jeremiah, we'll go to it next. I think next class we'll go there. But in the book of Jeremiah, you know, God tells him, the Holy Spirit leads him to do his prophetic ministry through actions. Right? Uh, go, do this. And when people ask you, you tell them what, why it is, right? Again, the Holy Spirit in First and Second Chronicles, David, people connected. Uh, you know, David again. He was connected to the Holy Spirit. God used David to come up with the plans uh, for the temple uh, that he had to build. Of course, he could not build it, but his son Solomon took over and built it. Then Nehemiah, in Nehemiah. God gave him the spirit. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 20. Nehemiah chapter 9. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheld not thy manna from their mouth and gave us them water from their thirst. God gave them the good spirit to instruct them. Now, if you read the story of Nehemiah, it's a wonderful story because he's, you know, he's he's a man who did something so wonderful. The, where he went to the king, he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and the gates. He was burdened to do it, and the Holy Spirit led him as to how to do it. What was Nehemiah's occupation? He was a cup bearer, meaning he had to take the cup of wine, go to the king, make sure everything is all right. No? So, but God used him as an engineer to build the walls of Jerusalem, and the gates were rebuilt. So God gives his good spirit to us, and he will instruct us and lead us. Right? So what we'll do is we'll stop here. And we'll start from Job next week onward. So can you just put a mark there? Uh, we'll start from Job.
from the next week. I've got a question here. According to the verse, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14, it is said that a harmful spirit came from God. So does that also, so does God also give harmful spirits? Okay. Now we must always take text to context, right? God is a good God. God is a loving God. God is a God who blesses. That does not change. So to answer your question, the spirit that came was not from God, meaning when we as believers, or even when we look at the life of uh, Saul, King Saul, he chose to disobey God. When he disobeyed God, he opened the door for the enemy to come in. Now, God didn't stop that. God allowed the enemy to work in his life because he opened the door. Right? So it was, it was not like God sent it. It was not like God sent that spirit. No, God allowed the spirit, the evil spirit, to work. But every time David played the harp, the spirit left. So what does it teach us? This is this, the, the, God allows certain things because the enemy gains entrance in our life with doors that we open. So remember, uh, Peter writes and he says, be aware, the the enemy is like a roaring lion trying to devour us. He's just looking for a way. So when we open the doors to the enemy, the enemy, the spirits, the evil spirits begin to work in our life. So I hope that answers your question, Shubham. Yes. All right, so let's close here. Any other question? Here. Yes. Uh, can you just give the mic, please? In that page 8, there's one verse, Genesis 6. He will no longer strive with men. What does that mean? Yeah, so he, the He is the Holy Spirit. He'll no longer strive with men, meaning the Holy Spirit will come, minister, and go. The ministry of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, He will strive, meaning He will be with us at all times. So, that's what it means. Okay, anything else? Okay, let's just quickly say a word of prayer and we'll close. Father, we thank you for today's word and we were able to get together and study your oh God. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. And even as we have learned so much from the Old Testament, I pray God that you will minister to each of our hearts, oh God. Lord, if there are areas in our life that we have to confess and Things that we have to remove from our life, oh God. I pray that through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you will enable us. Give us the grace, oh God. Lord, that you will convict us of our sins and you are faithful to forgive us, oh Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit inside of us. Lord, we pray that you will continue to minister to each and every one of us. Bless each student, oh God, who is learning. I pray that, Lord, you will speak to their hearts. And Lord, that you will reveal yourself in your own special way. We thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Wonderful weekend. I'll see you soon.